Presented by Caltech. We started to talk about forced couple oscillators with this example of two pendulums that are coupled by a spring with a force on one of the masses. So we got as far as doing coordinate transfer using the same coordinate transformation we did for the out of force motion uh, to the uh, coordinates where things diagonalize. And so we ended up with these two uncoupled equations for the forced motion, and we just perceived as, as before then with each one. So if, for example, our force is some sinusoidal cosine, so it's literally varying force, cosine omega t, and our differential equations just become one double dot plus uh, this is that expression there, the earlier from the unforced motion, just called that omega 1 squared, u1 is equal to the square root of u over 2, f naught over m cosine omega 2, where omega 1 squared is g over l plus 2 k over m. differential equation for u2, omega 2 squared, u2, square root of 2 over 2. So first term, and omega 2 squared, it's just g over l. So if we uh, neglect the homogeneous solution, Assume initial conditions such that everything starts out with the zero position and velocity, and just consider the force term. Uh, we get what we call the steady state motion due to the force. Steady state, there's just steady, is okay. Let's see. Okay, so it's just going to be, we can just assume that uj is e to the i over t times some coefficient e sub j, so j is 1 or 2. And, and plug that into each, so we're assuming that, that both of them have the same frequency dependence, that is the frequency dependence of the uh, driving term. Uh, and so both u1 and u2 go like an EGI omega t, and they have different coefficients in front of them because they may be excited in different ways. So let's see. So that means that uj second derivative is minus omega squared times uj. And we just plug in, try it. So this, if you'd like, this is our trial solution. We plug it in and see if it works, and also see what the uh, we can learn about the constants. So let's see. So we plug in a sub j times the whole rest of the stuff here is going to be a minus omega squared plus omega j squared times e to the i, i omega t is equal to the square root of 2 over 2 f naught over m times, I'll write my cosine omega t, I'll take that, that's going to be the real part of e to the i omega t. 
And so we read off from this that a sub j then for these two sides to be equal, a, so that cancels that, then uh, a sub j out of that the bottom, then we get this square root of 2 over 2, f naught over m, 1 over omega j squared, minus omega squared. This is kind of a familiar looking object. Uh, and so that we can get our solutions from u sub j, which is just a sub j. Omega squared times e to the i omega t. And then if we transform back to the x coordinates, that means the motion and mass a, x sub a, is just about the square root of 2 over 2 times whatever u1 and u2 are. And so the square root of 2 over 2 times <coughs> square root is 1 half. Um, F naught over M in both cases. And then U1 and U2 have a difference here. So we have 1 over omega 1 squared minus omega squared plus 1 over 6 plus sine 1 over omega 2 squared minus omega squared. So each of our normal modes propagates independently with an amplitude that depends on its natural frequency. Um, and then as reflected in the motion of say one of the masses, mass A, then you see each of the normal modes shows up the contribution to the amplitude. So in general, the motion of mass A is a superposition of the motions of the two normal modes. It's just a linear superposition of the motions of the two normal modes because this is just a linear condition. Um, and in particular, there are two frequencies now, omega 1 and omega 2, that I can tune my force to such that I get large motions. And in between, uh, something else, but they get large motions at two different frequencies. There are two resonances now. So let's take them apart. Do that x sub a is just just to draw the function of logical conclusion here. One equals square minus omega squared plus one over omega two squared minus omega squared <coughs> times cosine omega t. And x sub b likewise. So that'll be a square root of uh, 2 over 2 times what I mean, u2 minus u1, I think. Uh, and so that will give a 1 over omega 2 squared minus omega squared minus 1 over omega 1 squared minus omega squared plus omega 2. So not including the solution to the homogeneous equation, this is, this is the solution for my force motion. Of the masses A and B. Okay, so that wasn't too hard. I hope. So we've done two masses. Can, can we do three? So we have a 
measurements. Yes. Oh, keep some symmetry in the solution flow so it doesn't get too complicated. You spring coupling between adjacent pendula. The same spring constant. They're all the same mass. Uh, and then we'll do a coordinate system for each of the masses. Such that we call this one x sub a, x sub b, and x sub c. So if we can do three, then we can probably do four or five. Pretty soon we're up to infinity. Well, before we embark on this and write down the differential equation, let's just think a little bit. What are the normal modes going to be? We can probably guess two of them pretty easily. Well, first of all, there are three degrees of freedom. So we expect that there's going to be three normal modes. When we had one pendulum, we had one mode. Okay, we put two pendulum together and coupled them, we had two normal modes. Now, with three, we expect three. One of them is probably going to look something like this, or at least just go back and forth together. So the, spring, the springs don't extend or compress. Okay. And so we can probably actually guess what the frequency is going to be. Omega squared is probably going to be G over L, just like the other cases. Uh, and we can probably guess that, well, if this guy stays still and the two, other two just go back and forth, that's probably going to work too. So we're probably going to have a normal mode that looks like that. So this is moving back and forth at the same in this in phase with that one. What's the third one? Well, that may be a little harder to guess. I'm going to leave that as, no, that's not so obvious. And let's try to figure out what it is. So that's one of our goals, figure out what the third one of is. OK, now let's go and write down the differential equation. We've kind of looked at the problem, know a little bit about what we expect. Uh, and maybe we're at the point where we think we can uh, try to calculate the rest. So the differential equations, we're going to have x sub a double dot plus the g over l times x sub a from gravity plus the stretching of the spring that's connected <laughs> to it. So notice I'm not, I don't have a driving force on this. I could put one on, but I for you to start without it. I uh, certainly don't need the driving force to calculate the normal modes. X of A minus X of B is equal to zero. Okay, that's mass A, X of B. Well, let's see, let's do this spring first, minus K over M, X A minus X of B. Well, that's this spring. Now let me do this spring. <coughs> Plus k over m xb minus xc is equal to zero. So I guess it starts to get easy once you've uh, done it a couple of times. You just know what it's going to look like. And you know you're going to get the signs right without really looking too hard. Minus A over M, X, B minus C is equal to zero. Because I have three degrees of freedom, I have three coupled differential equations. And so 
Now I go through the process of writing this down maybe with some kind of matrix equation. Uh, and I'll notice there's a new symmetric matrix. I find an orthogonal matrix that diagonalizes it. Uh, and get my normal modes. So let's see. It's going to be a little bit of algebra. And I'm not going to do all that algebra. I'm going to be as lazy as I can and try to take a shortcut if I can. So, but let's see. But let's get started. X equals XA, XC, XC. So I'm defining a vector X that's got components XA, XB, XC. And so I'll write these equations as x double dot plus some matrix times x is equal to zero. What is M? <coughs> okay, so the first equation up there, the equation on the Say it's uh, we've got the second derivative on it. Um, G over L plus K over M. And that's that part that I get a minus K over M. And there's no coupling with mass C. Uh, and then I, you know, I could just make things symmetric. I could also read it off for, for, for uh, mass B in the second equation. I get a minus Q over M times XA. And I've got a G over L plus, okay, there's a K over M there and a K over M there. So it's 2K over M. And then mass C, I get a minus over M. And then the third one is a lot like A, 0 minus K over M, and G over L plus K over M. Okay. okay. So notice that again, there's a real symmetric matrix. I should be able to find an orthogonal matrix that diagonalizes it. But, you know, once you got three by three, it's maybe time to think if you can save a little effort. So let's see. Of course, it's clear already that I, I could make four here, and I could basically just write down and I had to think a tiny bit, but I could basically just write down the matrix. And I go to five. I'm going to write down the matrix. Six. I write down the matrix. It's not hard. We'll do that. Okay. Um, I could also go to unequal masses and unequal spring constants. And the matrix will be a little different, but I could write it down. Not really fundamentally any harder. Things get more complicated when you take away the symmetry of the system in terms that don't cancel all so nicely. Anyway, we expect three eigenvectors and three eigenvectors. We don't say what they are. We know two of them, okay? Let's let's use that. I mean, okay, if if they if we guessed wrong, then we'll find that we guessed wrong. Okay. But we're pretty sure. So let's go go with it. <laughs> Some physical insight. Here's two of them. So let's see. So I'm going to define. So 
So again, I'm going to assume I've got a coordinate transformation to where m is diagonal. And I'm going to use these pictures to decide what this transformation is up, up to some level. I'm going to say I've got a coordinate transformation that takes the positions of the three masses, just adds them, and that gives me the U1 coordinate system in my other coordinate system. That gives me the U1 component in the other coordinate system. So U sub 1 is, is the first component in my other coordinate system. And I am the first component. And this is the coordinate transformation. I just write it down. I didn't diagonalize any matrix because I'm, I'm guessing. Okay. Uh, and uh, so along with this, I'm supposing that if I have a vector in this other coordinate system, it is 1, 0, 0. It is only along the first direction of the <coughs> coordinate system. That's going to be a normal mode. And it's going to have a frequency, omega 1 equals square root of g over l, the mode where all of them go back and forth together. OK. That one there. Just xa minus xc, x sub b is staying at 0. So this is G over L plus K over M, I think. It's just this guy is going to oscillate here with that spring constant. This guy is going to oscillate here with that spring constant. So the frequency is just going to be square root of G over L plus K. And my goal now is to find the third. So I've got these two vectors. So I've got two vectors here. See in the x system, it's like an x that's so this is like a one and one and one, they all have the same magnitude and phase. This is like a one zero minus one in the x system. X coordinates. In either system, my two vectors are orthogonal to each other. I take this dot this, I get zero. I take that dot that, I get zero. Okay, they ought to be orthogonal in both systems, yeah. Why is like the frequency two that you found there square root of g over L plus k over m? Like why does that why is that different than like what you found for the this system where um, I think it was g over L plus two k over m? Yeah. Okay, in this case I have two masses that are pushing this spring. Okay. In that case I have one mass that's Pushing the spring, the other mass is, is staying the same. So I get into factor two there. So with, yeah, so so anytime something really doesn't quite make sense, you go back to the equations and just work it out. Make sure that you guessed right. I mean, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So the third, the third normal mode is. Something that oscillates by itself. It doesn't excite the other two. It doesn't couple to the other two. The vector describing it should better be orthogonal to the other two. So the third is orthogonal. So, okay. 
So I have, if I look at things in the X coordinate system now, so I'm trying to be careful, but, but at the same time, I'm trying to be sloppy, okay? And the point is, I am sloppy, but I'm trying to be careful to tell you how I'm being sloppy, okay? So, I, you know, I don't want you to be confused. So in the x coordinate system, we have a vector that I've denoted by u1. I really better put some kind of thing that denotes that it's a vector. Because here's the sloppiness. Where is the sloppiness? Somewhere I have it. I wrote x equals x a x b x c. X is a vector. So normally I go along and I say, okay, I've got a vector u1. And I go along narrowly. But I've used the symbol u1 here to be the component of a vector. Now it gets really confusing if you're not thinking about what's going on. So I'll try to be a little careful here. But, but I probably lapse into dropping the vector sign. And then you just have to understand when I'm talking about a vector, when I'm talking about a component. And I'm using the same symbol for two different things. That gets a little scary. Okay, so try to keep keep this in mind and, and bug me if it's if it's really getting uh, unclear. So the vector um, in the x coordinate system associated with the first normal mode is just if I normalize it, one over square root of three, one one one. It's just this vector, and I just normalized it with one over square root of three. So the u1 dot u1 is 1. Okay. Likewise, u2, with the vector side of it, so the, the squiggle underneath is the uh, typesetter's notation for whole face or something. Okay, u2, okay, that's 1 on the screen of 2, 1, 0, and then this one. Just that. Okay. You got me a third one. That'd be our final to these. Well, I don't know what it is quite yet. So let me just denote it as A, B, C. It's got some components called A, B, C, which are nicely labeled to correspond to motion of mass A, B, C, because we're in the X system. So now we need to figure out what U3 is. And fortunately, since we know everything else, all we need to do is use orthogonal. We, need, we know that U1 dot U3 is equal to 0, and U2 dot U3 is equal to 0. Okay. okay, so that means, so this means that A plus B plus C is equal to zero. So that's progress. This means that A minus C is equal to zero. So C is equal to A. So 2A plus B is equal to zero. So therefore B is equal to minus 2A. Okay, so if I normalize this, so U3 vector is equal to 1 over square root of 6. To normalize, you can check, 1 minus 2, 1. B is equal to minus 2A, A and C are the same. That's my third normal moment. I, I got away with not solving it, I get very problem in any uh, detail. Of course you can't always do that. 
oh, well, okay, so now we can actually, this is in the x, this is, this vector, the third vector represented in the x coordinate system, so these are, these are explicitly motions of mass A, B, and C, so we can see what it looks like. So if A, so if A is going like this, B is kind of going way over like this, and C is going like this. And that mode will just slosh back and forth, keeping these, these relationships without coupling to the other modes. Uh, what's the frequency? Hmm. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, frequency. M U3 is equal to omega 3 squared U3. Remember that the eigenvalues <coughs> of this matrix are in fact the square frequencies. So now I can write down my eigenvalue equation. I already know what U3 is, and so it's an easy matter to then just plug that, plug in and determine what omega 3 is. Omega 3 squared. Let's see, what is it? And, and in fact, we don't have to do the whole thing, you know, because we know that it's going to give you three here. All we need to do is find this. So we just do the first row. Multiply the first row of the matrix there. Unless you want to check that you really get this. Uh, okay, then it really works. Let's see. So we just multiply the first row of M. That will give, there's a G over L plus K over M times one. Uh, I'll leave out this, or, you know, the one of the square root of six cancels on both sides, so I'm not going to pay any attention to it. The second one has a minus two on it from here, and then it's uh, minus K over M. Third has a one, uh, oh, and a zero, okay, uh, plus zero. It is equal to G over L plus three K over M. That's equal to omega three squared. It may not be quite so intuitive as the others, but at least it's plausible. And your springs are certainly doing more work than just sort of one or two. Get a three K over it. Okay. So. In the notes that will get posted on the web, there will be a page on orthonormality, orthonormal systems of coordinates, and uh, what, you, what happens if you if you happen to have degenerate eigenvalues, eigenvalues the same value, but you can actually still get orthogonal coordinates. But I won't do that here. All right, that's it. You know, that we can add a force, we can do lots of other things. We basically know how to do all this now. Change our masses, whatever. We know how to do this. Let's, let's go on to, so, so I'm gonna eventually kind of treat this kind of stuff as a building project. <coughs> I think there's a question. <laughs> oh, sorry. I could do the other two. So if I if I did the second row, I would get another sum here and get something exactly the same thing. Because I have to have 
I, I have to have m times <coughs> e3 is omega 3 squared e3. So the first so the first row, I got the, the one up here. It's going to give me the one on the other side. The second row is two. It's going to give you a minus two when I, when I multiply it out. Is, is that, should I do them? Let's do it every row. Second row, okay. I'll have minus three over m. That's the one times the minus k over m. Then I will have a minus two times uh, the no part <coughs> p over l plus uh, 2k over m. And then I have, uh, if I have this one on the third part there, it's going to give me a plus the one times a minus. Did I get that right? Minus k over m. And I get, what do I get? <coughs> I get, oh gosh, what a mess. I get a minus 2g over L minus, what did we get? Minus 6, minus 6 k over L, which is just minus 2 times g over L plus 3 k over L. So I've just got this minus 2 times the same result. And, and since I already was pretty sure I was right about my uh, components, I didn't bother to do it. But it's a good check to do, if you're not sure. OK. So these are, we can imagine putting a lot of these together. You know, instead of 2 or 3, go to 50, 60. 500, whatever, put it together, tweak one in the end, and watch it couple through to all the others along the way. It's kind of like a wave. It's, it's like a, you're making a pulse go along. And we call that a traveling wave. So I'm going to talk about traveling waves. Of course, there are many kinds of waves that you're familiar with. We can have waves where um, like a water wave, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. It's kind of like, it's going transverse to the direction of the wave, the, the motion is. You know, the motion of the wave is in this direction, but the water is going up and down. So it's transverse, called a transverse wave. Uh, it can go in the same direction. If I had a system of springs on a line, I tweak one over here and the pulse goes along here, but the, the motion is actually along the same direction as the wave is traveling. Sound waves, longitudinal waves, compression along the direction of the wave. Not all waves need a medium. The water wave as water is a medium, the sound wave as air is a medium. Uh, we have electromagnetic waves <coughs> that travel through perfectly well through a vacuum. Um, we have quantum mechanics. If you have an electron, well, it's an electron, it's sitting here as some mass and so forth, but it can also be described as a wave. So this is this particle <coughs> wave duality that you may have heard about. Where the wavelength of my electron or whatever particle I'm thinking of is 
related to its momentum. Something called the De Bruyne wave length. So in quantum mechanics, the wavelength of a particle is just something called Planck's constant. Divided by the momentum of the particle. <coughs> and that's, that's done relativistically. It's a general statement. One of the ways <coughs> the waves are what we call probability amplitude. <coughs> So when x, when x moves on my pendulum, it's moving with some amplitude, x is moving with some time. The energy is proportional in some way to the squares of the amplitudes. In quantum mechanics, probabilities are proportional to the squares of the amplitudes. The absolute squares, because these are actually, we actually keep these complex. There's a wave equation in quantum mechanics called the Schrodinger equation. That's really just a wave equation. It's a little different than the wave equation that we're going to look at for now. Um, but waves are ubiquitous. Uh, these probability amplitudes in quantum mechanics, they behave an awful lot like the waves we're talking about here. What we learn here, we can apply in quantum mechanics. Just a different setting. If we have time at the end, we'll, we'll even do the Heisenberg a little bit, certainly principle from what we know. Maybe I'll call it that. So, anyway, waves are important. You know that. A traveling wave is one that travels from over here to over there, traveling one from one place to another. Possibly through a medium or an electromagnetic pulse, just maybe through free space. Uh, but the wave is what's traveling, the medium is basically staying in, in one place. So let's, let's just consider some function y equals f of x. X, Y. Here's Y equals F of X. So it may be doing something in time. This function may be moving to the right as a function of time. So we may have at some, later time, that the wave has moved over here maybe. Y equals F of X. Well, let's see, so this is time T. And this is time T1 equals T plus delta T. So if the whole thing's just moved over to the right, there's some velocity maybe times V delta T relative to that one. The whole pulse, the pulse has stayed the same, it's just moved, it's just moved over. This is called a traveling wave.
Or it doesn't have to just move to the left, it could move to the right. Let's see. So for the case of it moving to the, to the left, it was y of x and t. I can express that as my function f evaluating at x minus dt. So as I move, as I increase time, the pulse is moving over in x with speed d. the way it is v. Likewise, we could have one moving to the right just by changing the sign. Yeah. Sorry, I understand this example why it's subtracting. Because it seems like your time t original is like more to the left. So, so, t, so, so, so t equals zero looks like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to move this over to the right. So at some later time, t, I want to have y of x and t. I want to move, move it from over here, say x naught. I want to move it over to x naught plus dt. And so the function is going to be uh, then in terms of the in terms of the f of x, it's going to be f evaluated <laughs> at x minus vt, so that this is it. Uh, so that what started at x naught here, I plug x naught in here, x naught minus vt is is if somewhere over there, so I've got to. So so to get the to get the same point on the wave, I have to plug x naught plus vt in here. So if I plug x naught plus vt in here, I'll have x of x naught, which is just that value. Is that okay? Some of you look okay. See, I have to have the function at this point be the same as the value of the function at this point over here at the earlier time. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned on this board here that the wave was moving to the right, but then you also mentioned on the other board that it was moving to the right. Did you perhaps mean left? Left. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Dyslexic. Should I try again or are we okay? At least I'm going to try again. Okay. Um, so we're especially interested in waves that have some sinusoidal variation. For example, y of x and t could be equal to a times t e to the, well, which one is e to the 2 pi over lambda times x minus e t, just to make it more complicated. Of course, we're going to take the real part of this, but, but uh, we don't need to worry about that at this point. It's just a convenient way to write it. And in this case, we interpret lambda as the wavelength. <laughs> the 
because if you change x from x to x plus lambda, you'll just go through 2 pi. And my phase factor is exponential. So that is, you'll get back to the same, same value of uh, the amplitude of the wave. So lambda is the wavelength. Um, the wave repeats every x plus n lambda. Um, or we could say for fixed x, or for fixed x, when vt goes to vt plus lambda, so you hear it, then you also come back to, you also go through 2 pi phase here and come back to the same value. I'll change vt by 2, two pi. Okay. vt over there divided by 1. He is assumed to be a constant. I'm assuming Mike Voss is a constant. And so therefore, when delta vt equals lambda, that means v delta t is equal to lambda since v is a constant. So I interpret this um, delta t which is a change in time, so that's the period of the wave. Which I'll just call capital T is just lambda divided by v. That's the period of the wave. Since the frequency is just 1 over the period, so mu in terms of cycles is 1 over the period, then we have mu equals v over lambda or so it's mu here, or v is just the frequency times the wavelength, which of course we already do. So get everything on the board. The angular frequency omega is just two pi times mu. There's two pi radians in one cycle. And finally, to set up our notation, let's define what we call the wave number you know, the K, it's not a spring constant, it's the wave number. We write out the symbols. So K is used. Not only for the squeak constant, it's used for the wave number. This is defined as um, 2 pi divided by the wavelength. So it has units of inverse length. <coughs> Note that if I were to take uh, k times the velocity, get 2 pi times the velocity over lambda. That's equal to 2 pi 
times the frequency mu, which is just omega. So k times v is omega. Actually, an important thing to keep in mind. So, I want to write down one more line, so I won't waste the whole word. We can write our wave as, uh, using, using this notation that I've introduced, we can write the wave that we started with, I of x and t up there, we can write it as, well, we have our constant a, we still have the exponential with pi, but that exponential 2 pi over lambda times x minus vt just becomes kx minus omega t. And this is a very standard way of writing a wave. So we'll be doing this a lot. So that's enough for today. We'll get to the next time we'll do the wave equation.